Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, it's easy to know which speaker I am because I don't have a cool accent. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Okay. Frontiers of AI research capabilities and challenges. I'm just going to give a, a very quick tour of some of the things that AI can do now and some of the things it, it can't do. Overall, it's a very exciting time. We see, uh, we see AI all around us. It's mostly due to great improvements in the capabilities of algorithms which have happened in the last few years. So many of us, I'm sure, use devices like an Alexa or like Siri. We can do amazing things with these. We can talk to them. They sort of understand what we're saying. They sometimes give slightly witty responses. Um, and we can even do things which would have seen science fiction just 10 years ago where you can speak in one language into, say, Google Translate, and out will come another language in real time. In computer vision, as probably many of you know, in ideal contexts, we're now at the point where machines can do as well as a human at recognizing objects or faces, um, and, that's, and that's already very impressive. Um, although, well, even, even perhaps better than just recognizing object and faces, they can even do things like caption images. Um, so let's take a look at some of these pictures. If you look at the top left, this is uh, an image that was fed to a trained model, and the model has come up with this caption, little girl is eating piece of cake, which is pretty good. And it suggests that maybe it actually understands what's going on in the picture. Uh, let's move across to two places to the right. Woman is holding bunch of bananas. Also pretty impressive. But let's look at the bottom left here, and there's a very cute baby that's clearly holding a toothbrush, but the algorithm is, is a little bit confused. It says a young boy is holding a baseball bat. So that's not quite right. If we go over to, uh, to the image at the bottom right, you'll see this image, not quite clear where it is, but it's a sort of scene where you can imagine there might be a horse standing. And if you squint your eyes, maybe some of those Vertical lines look a bit like a horse, but the algorithm is being, is being confused. The algorithm um, is saying that there's a horse standing in the middle of the road. So it's clearly being confused. And it's important to keep in mind that the way these algorithms are working today is really they've, they've just been trained on lots of labeled images. So after seeing many, many, many images which look something like the ones they're shown, they learn what sorts of labels human give to those images. They don't really know what's going on inside them. We need to be careful not to overestimate the extent to which they understand. So a lot of the success that we've seen recently is due to deep learning. I'm sure many of you have, have heard about deep learning. And what is deep learning? Well, really, it's um, in many ways just the same methods that have been used for decades. Neural network models very loosely inspired by what goes on in our brain, although much more simplified. Um, but we've seen maybe three main improvements that have led to, led to great increases in capability. One is we have seen some improvements in the algorithms themselves and the architectures themselves. And that's, that's important, and clearly there are lots of people working on that. But two trends that have been very important that also contribute enormously to the improvements in their capabilities, one of them is the massive increase in the amount of data that's available, and the other is the massive increase in the amount of computational power that's available. And that's important to note because both of those trends, as far as we can tell, are likely to, to keep continuing. So even if we don't improve the algorithms themselves, it's very likely that these algorithms will continue to get better and better. So one of the interesting things about deep learning approaches is that unlike some other methods in machine learning, which 10 years ago would have performed better, with deep learning, so far as, as far as we can tell, when you keep throwing more compute power and more data at them, they seem to get better and better. So there's hope that they will continue to improve for the tasks which they're good at now, which are tasks of perception, so things like audio and image perception. But they have some, uh, some difficulties, some limitations. In particular, they're very data hungry. You often need millions of labeled examples. They can take a lot of computational power, and that can take a lot of actual energy power. They're not very good at representing uncertainty, which we'll talk about soon. And partially because of that, they're easily fooled by adversarial examples. We'll show that on the next slide. Just give me a sense. Who here has heard about adversarial examples? Maybe about half of you. OK, good. They can be tricky to optimize. And also an important aspect about them is that they are typically very hard to understand in the sense that they, they may have millions of, of weights that have been trained on a data set. 
Um, and then perhaps they'll perform well on a test set, but it's very tricky to really know exactly what they're doing, which can make it difficult to know whether or not we should trust them when they apply to, to real world situations. So I mentioned adversarial examples, and this, this is quite a famous picture. This was from a paper uh, from just three years ago that was maybe the first one to really explore this problem. So what's happened is we've, we've had a deep learning system which is trained to recognize many different types of objects. After it's been trained on all these different objects, thousands of different of classes of objects, it's then shown this picture on the left. It's a cute picture of a panda. And happily, the algorithm does a good job. It thinks that it's a panda, and it has 58% confidence, which is pretty good because there are thousands of different things it might think it is. So far, it's doing pretty well. The tricky thing is that if you then just add this tiny amount of noise, 0.007 amount of this picture in the middle, which to us looks just like weird color noise, what we get is the image on the right, which for us looks identical to the image on the left. But now the algorithm thinks that there's a 99% chance that it's a gibbon, something totally different. Doesn't think it's a panda at all. And what's happened is that this, this weird image in the middle was specially chosen. Once, the, once, it, once you know the learned model, you can pick the image, which in a sense is moving in the direction, moving in the gradient, specially chosen to make the model think that it's going to be a gibbon. And you only have to move a little bit in that direction to make it fooled in this way. You could have picked any other object class that you knew about, and you could have done something quite similar. At first, you might think that this isn't really a problem in the real world, because how is this sort of thing going to happen? But let me give you a more worrying example. We may have to, oops. Oh, it looks like the video is not, not working, unfortunately. So let me, let me describe what's going on here. This is, um, this is from a paper just, just last year, and it's using a, um, an advanced uh, state-of-the-art system for the time to try to detect what, uh, what uh, a vehicle is seeing in front of it. And just for, for, to start with, look at the image on the right. I'm sorry, I know it's a bit hard to tell because things are quite far away. What's happening is that a car is driving along a road going towards a stop sign, a stop sign you can just about see in the distance. And on the right, it's a regular stop sign. And what we would see if you watch this video, which actually you can probably find on YouTube, so you can watch it later if you like. As you go along, um, it shows what the algorithm thinks it's seeing in front of it. And if we saw the video, we would see stop sign being shown on the right. So as we approach stop sign, everything is good. The algorithm can see the stop sign, it recognizes the stop sign, and it will know that it should come to a halt. All good. On the left, this is quite tricky to see from here. On the left, we've got the same setup, but some naughty person has stuck a little bit of black and white tape onto the stop sign in special places, just a bit like the adversarial example we saw before, in order to try to fool the algorithm. And in this case, what we would see as the car was driving along is that the algorithm doesn't see the stop sign. It thinks it says speed limit 45. So it just keeps going. And that's obviously very worrying. It's, it's a danger in the real world. So, so th this is a problem. It's a real problem. We don't have a good solution. We are working on methods. The community is working on methods. We've basically, we've got a little bit better, but we're really far from having solved this problem. And it also shows that these algorithms are thinking, if you want to use that word, in a way which is fundamentally quite different to the way that humans think and see things. Oh, now we've got the video. So now I've described it. You see on the left, it sees speed limit 45, and you see the little bit of black and white tape. OK, let me go on to, um, to talk a little bit more about, about what these algorithms are missing for the moment. And this is really a big research challenge for the community. How can we develop something like what we have as common sense understanding? Actually, common sense is made up of lots of different things. It involves priors we learn about the way the world works and abilities that we have to be able to learn in one environment, extrapolate to another. But let me show you some examples of, of where algorithms currently go wrong. So here's a picture, it's a very beautiful image, and it's been automatically labeled with some tags. So it's, it's come up with the label hillside, which is perfectly good. But then it's got some weird labels, grazing, sheep, and no sheep really in the pictures, uh, giraffe, herd. So what's going on? Again, this is a bit like the example we saw before. This algorithm has been trained on many images, and on the images on which it was trained, this kind of image often went with sheep. And if you, if you kind of squint, maybe you can sort of make out a sheep. A sheep. Even if you, if you squint hard, on the left, you can sort of see how you might get a giraffe. I don't know if you, if you can see that. But so again, this shows that it's not thinking the way that humans do. If, as a human, what we would probably do, we'd move our head around. We'd try to see if things are moving. And we're working towards those kinds of systems, but we're not there yet. 
Spe speaking of sheep, now if we actually have a real sheep, a baby sheep, cute little lamb, and someone has picked it up, this algorithm hasn't seen a child holding a lamb very often, but it's, it's seen children holding a puppy, a dog often, so it thinks a woman is holding a dog, or a, a man is holding a dog. Again, it's, it's confused. And now, this is a nice example, if, uh, if, the, if there are sheep, but the sheep are painted orange, the algorithm now thinks it's a group of orange flowers in a field, because that's the sort of thing it's, it's used to seeing. We show a different, a different way in which algorithms don't yet have common sense understanding. This is a nice example that was written up by Douglas Hofstadter, who some of you may know, wrote, wrote the famous book, Gödel Escher Bach. So he wrote this, this piece in January talking about the way that Google Translate works. So Google Translate does a, a great job most of the time, but this, this example nicely shows where it doesn't really understand the overall sense of what, what someone's trying to say. So we're translating this English paragraph on the left in their house, everything comes in pairs. So this whole thing is going to be about pairs. There's his car and her car, his towels and her towels. Now, when Google Translate tries to convert this into French, apologies for my poor French accent, um, the difficulty is that the possessive adjective in English varies according to who is doing the possessing, the his or the her. Whereas in French, it varies depending on the uh, on the object which is being possessed, whether it's masculine or feminine. So here we have il y a sa voiture et sa voiture. It's the same word because car is feminine. Ses serviettes et ses serviettes. Again, it's exactly the same possessive adjective. So it's, it's literally correct locally, but it's entirely missing the global sense of what the original author was trying to convey. So again, this is, this is a lacking of common sense understanding. Big research challenge for our community. Another example, um, who here knows, knows what a segue is? Interesting, about, I wonder if it's the same people who know about adversarial examples. <laughs> so a segue is this device which was quite popular a few years ago. You stand on this thing with two wheels and you push it and you move around in quite a cool way. And once you've seen a segue, so if, even if you haven't seen one before, here's an example of one at the, at the top on the left. Once you've seen one of those, most people, I won't test, but most people can pretty quickly say which of the things beneath it are also segues. And it turns out this is actually very challenging for an algorithm. So, you know, an algorithm might try to do things like figure out, well, how many wheels does it have? But you see there are items there that also have two wheels that clearly we realize are not segues because we have this sort of common sense physics understanding. We understand how things move and how they relate. So we can immediately get the sense that a segue, no, a segue has two wheels on either side and it's going to move forward. Um, and so we, we, we understand that, but it's very challenging to get an algorithm to do that. Maybe I'll, I'll skip the one on the right in interest of time. One more example. Let's see if this video plays. So this, this, is, this is a famous example from, from DeepMind. I think uh, maybe uh, their success was, was, was mentioned recently. They, so that this, this is from 2015. Wonderful piece of work they did that was written up in Nature. They had this algorithm which could play over 50 different Atari games. And the same algorithm could start from scratch, and after playing for a long time, would get really quite good at every one of these games. Many of them would get to superhuman capabilities. And we'll see it as it, as it gets better and better. Maybe it's not as entertaining as the chicken example, but this is, this, is, this is breakout. And one of the particularly nice things that happens here is that after a while, the algorithm figures out a strategy which, which the authors themselves didn't know, but those of you who are around in the 80s would remember, which is, is that in breakout, it's actually good to knock a hole in, in the side, and then you bounce the ball around the back, and we'll see, and off it goes, and it knocks lots of bricks out. So that was very cool that the algorithm, in a sense, figured that out itself. In a way, you could say it was creative. It did something which, it's, uh, which the developers didn't even know about. So that's very impressive, and it seems as if maybe it's a bit general, because the same algorithm, algorithm could play many different games. But just to point out the limitations of it, how it's really very far from being general in any really useful sense. So if you start with the original breakout game, but now you put an extra wall in the middle, so we're just changing the game very slightly, or if you move the paddle, the bat, just a little bit closer to the wall, which to a human wouldn't really make a lot of difference, or you change the layout of the wall a little bit, each of these things wouldn't affect a human very much. But if you try this with the original DeepMind algorithm, it gets completely lost and it has to start completely from scratch again. 
It's just as if it didn't know anything. So it's, it, it's, all it's doing is really seeing the pixels and trying to figure out what joystick moves to make. It doesn't have any actual conceptual sense about a bat and a ball and the bricks and what, what it's trying to do. Obviously, if it did have that, that would be very useful because then it could apply that somewhere else and learn much more quickly. This is an active area of research. Let me finally just mention that uh, another very important area of research is we really want algorithms which we can deploy in the real world. What we want are algorithms which people can trust so that we can use these in society. And we don't want people to trust algorithms willy-nilly. They don't want to trust them too much. We want to have reliable measures of trustworthiness so people can know that, that they can rely on these algorithms not abusing them. And that's going to require more work that, that has started in our community on, on topics like interpretability, fairness, respecting privacy, measuring the, the extent to which they influence us, the al algorithms influence us. So let me conclude by saying it's a very exciting time for AI. We've seen enormous increases in data and computing power, and that, together with improved algorithms, has yielded much better capabilities, and there are all sorts of applications immediately available to us today. But we're still far from general AI or common sense reasoning. Danny did a good job of describing many of, much of the work in progress that's going towards that direction, but we still might be far away. We're also seeing a rapid increase in the use of algorithmic systems in areas which directly affect our lives, in really important areas such as hiring decisions or perhaps even more so in criminal justice. I'm mentioning ads also because although sometimes we think that's not important, increasingly we're really seeing the world through a lens that's, that's been filtered by, uh, by companies who are just trying to show us things that we're going to click on in the short run. And that, in a sense, might be giving us what we want, loosely speaking, but it's not really giving us probably what's in our long-term best interest or what's in the best interest of society, and that's something we need to think about. For effective deployment, in society, we need these measures of trustworthiness, including robust performance, transparency, fairness, and appropriate privacy. And one of the things that thinking about those topics um, makes me wonder about, and I think is particularly fascinating as we think about improving AI capabilities in those areas, is it also makes us reflect a little bit about our own human capabilities and our own human failings. We're not always the most uh, transparent in the way that we think about things ourselves, and certainly many of us have the potential for bias. Thank you.